chapter 16, 16 through 40. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, These men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. As suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of, the ni of that night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into the house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No. Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would bless the, pre bless the reading of your word, Father, and now bless the preaching of your word. May your spirit empower me. May your spirit open my brothers and sisters' eyes and ears and hearts to the words that you have for them this morning. Transform us by the power of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts is, a, is in some ways a difficult book to preach. Now it's a glorious book and a wonderful book, but it's kind of one consistent theme throughout, right? Right? The gospel, the proclamation of the gospel, and the growth of the gospel. So again, it's, it's hard in the sense that that seems to be the theme every Sunday that I'm preaching on. But, but it is absolutely glorious. And the things that we see in the diversity of ways that God is doing his work is magnificent. And we see it here. We saw it last week with Lydia, right? This God-fearer. She wasn't a Jew. She was a Gentile, a God-fearer. Yet... God led Paul and Silas and, and Timothy and Luke to, to this prayer meeting to meet with this group of women and God opened Lydia's heart, this God-fearer, to become a follower of Jesus Christ. This woman who was of wealth, of means, probably well-respected there in the city of Philippi. So God reaches out to her. And now we see in these verses a couple of other people that God reaches out to, that God frees and we'll get into that in just a moment more. But Acts is, is again, 
one of those books that I absolutely love it. But there seems to be a little bit of a pressure every week. Lord, how am I going to make this a little different? Because this, is again, is about the proclamation of gospel, the growth of the gospel. And then I start digging into his word, and he says, don't worry about it. Just preach what's here. You don't have to worry about making it entertaining, making it exciting. This is my word. And all you have to talk about is what I do, how I work, how I save people, how I set people free. That's enough. I agree. So today we're going to be looking at how, again, he sets two more people free. But not just how he sets people free, kind of the, the, the workings of, of how he works with his followers and what we oftentimes have to go through for the proclamation of the gospel to go forth, to go forward. But we start before we start getting into that, we're going to have a little bit more of a Greek myth lesson today, Greek mythology. If you remember a few weeks ago, I feel like I spent like 10 minutes or so talking about Greek mythology, but I think it, was, think it was very important for that particular time. Well, it's also important here for us to understand who this slave girl is and this power of, of divination that she has here. Because this is some kind of power that she has. There is something about her that she is able to, to talk about the future. Now, there's a lot of fortune tellers out there, and, and you go in and they read their, your palm, and as they're reading your palm, they're asking you these questions, right? And as they ask you these questions, these questions give them a lot of insight into your life, and so then they tell your future, right? Well, it's so generic and so generalized, they're not really telling your future. In some ways, they're telling everyone's future. Because that's how general oftentimes this is. There's something happening here. There's some kind of power of divination that has given her some kind of abilities. Now, they thought that this power was coming from Pythia. So that's, that's the word that we have here for divination, Pythia. And where does that come from? It's, it's this word for python. Now, what in the world does that mean? The power of python? I mean, it sounds kind of cool, right? But it's not. Because what's happening here is... If you go, again, back into Greek mythology, there was this, this python that, that guarded the temple Delphi. And Apollo was, was this, this python's mortal enemy. Now, keep in mind, this is all fiction, okay? This is myth. So Apollo goes in one day, and he, and he destroys python. He kills python. And it's at that time that he kind of reestablishes or remakes his home there at Delphi, and it's called the Delphi Oracle. And it's at this time that priestesses, would, 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 they would be the ones that were kind of over the Delphi Oracle. Now, there is a lot I'm leaving out here. I'm, I'm very, giving you a very simplified version of this. There's a lot more to it, but you'll get the idea. These priest, priestesses were here, and they would prophesy, right? People would come, and they would hear what the oracles of Delphi had to say. And they, it, was, it was thought that these priestesses had the spirit of Python. This Python who had been killed, now this spirit of Python was giving them these abilities to tell the future. And so that's what's happening here. They think that this slave girl has the spirit of Pythia, has the spirit of Python, has the spirit of divination because of the power that he gives. Well, of course, Paul comes in, and Paul understands where this power truly comes from. It doesn't come from a dead snake. It is demonic in origin. He understands that completely. Now, we also understand that from the Old and the New Testament, dabbling in the, the realm of the demonic is strictly prohibited, right? It's, it's very clear. So if you have a Ouija board, throw it away. All right? Now you think, oh, I, don't, I don't have a Ouija board, Todd. I don't go to the, 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 the palm reader that used to be up on 29 North. I don't do those types of things. But what about a horoscope? How often do you just, just happen to make your way over to the horoscope and read that? And if it's a good horoscope, if it's positive, it kind of lifts you up a little bit. If it's not so good of a horoscope, it kind of deflates you a little bit. Now, you know, we kind of make light of that, but in reality, these are the types of things that we're talking about here. We need to be very, very careful when we start dabbling in those things. What, what's the power? What's the power behind that? If it's not the power of God, there are two powers in the universe, right? If it's not the power of God, it is the power of the demonic realm. Plain and simple. People may not want to hear that, 
People may not may, may disagree with that, but, but give me an alternative. For us as Christians, that's what we have to believe. There are two realms. It is a spiritual realm. We have the physical realm, spiritual realm. And in that spiritual realm, you have God and his realm of righteous holiness. And you have the demonic. Now, I'm not going to spend any more time on horoscopes or anything like that. Because I really want to spend a little more time on this slave girl and what is happening here. She's following them around, right? We had such a promising start with Lydia. Lydia and her family came to Christ, and we kind of think of that as, as her home probably became the center of ministry, and we know that they continued a relationship on after this, and they were a great support, and now all of a sudden they are, they are continuing on, they're going back to a place to, pl uh, to pray, and this woman is behind them continually yelling out these things. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation, and this she kept doing for many days. Now, this salvation that she's talking about isn't the salvation that we know about, that we understand. Again, think about it. They thought that she, was, that she had uh, some kind of Greek spirit within her, the, the spirit of Python. That's the kind of mentality they have. They, didn't, they weren't coming from a Judeo-Christian understanding of reality. So when you say salvation... In our culture today, oftentimes people won't know what you're talking about, right? When you sell salvation in this kind of culture, they weren't thinking Jesus. They weren't thinking being set free from your sins and the bondage of your sins. That wasn't it. Salvation to them was more being, being uh, freed from your daily burdens, being freed from maybe sickness that you had. Maybe you would be saved out of that sickness in some way. Those types of things. So it was much more of a kind of the daily burdens, the daily troubles that we go through, that maybe when, they, when she said this word salvation, that was more what they were thinking, because that was the culture, not a salvation, the freeing from your sins, being pardoned. So she follows along, follows along, crying out many, many, many days. And Paul was human, and I'm so thankful it says that here, that he was annoyed, Right? Paul was annoyed. Now, I, I have a question as to why he didn't set her free earlier. You know, as soon as she started following, why didn't he just turn around and say, demon, come out of her? He didn't, right? This happened for a few days. I, and, and, you know, anything I say here as far as why he didn't, why, why he didn't do this is, is pure speculation, right? We just don't know. But you just wonder, though, if Paul understood what kind of trouble this was going to cause him. We, we know that in the future, something similar happens, right? And, and at the temple of Artemis and the, the silversmiths there, Demetrius, when people start becoming believers in Jesus, all of a sudden they, start, they stop buying all of these silver idols that he's made to the, the goddess of, of Artemis. And so he starts to get angry. So that's going to happen. We know that happens in the future. I wonder if Paul kind of knew... If I do that, the people who own her, who make money from her, they are going to get angry with me. And maybe that will stop the ministry that I have here. I don't know. Maybe that was in the back of his mind. We just don't know what the reason was, but we know ultimately he turned and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And that started the ball rolling as far as times of trouble coming their way. Because again, that's exactly what happened. When that power left her, that demon left her, she no longer had the power to tell people's futures, to, to, to divine for them, her owners were angered. Her owner, owners saw that the money that they were making, the easy life, I mean, they were spiritual pimps. Let's just be honest, that's exactly what they were. They were making money off of her spiritual abilities. And so now those abilities were gone. They had no need for her anymore, but they were angered. They were angered so much that they dragged Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. Now, in reality, they didn't really tell them why they were angry, did they? They didn't go in there and say, listen, this man, these, these two men, they threw the demon out of our slave girl, and now she can't tell the future, and we don't make money anymore. 
They, they made it sound a little better than that, didn't they? Because that would have sounded very self-serving. That would have sounded very uncaring. Wait a minute, she had a demon in her and now she's free? That's a good thing. No, they, 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 sound, they made it sound a lot better than that. But they didn't really tell a lie. These men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept as practice. Well, not only were they Jews, but now they were Jewish Christians. Now, they were in a pagan culture, right? And in a pagan culture, everything goes. Anything goes. The only thing that doesn't go is say that there's one God. That's the only thing in this culture that you can't say. That there's one God, that there's one being worthy of all of your praise and worship. Because this is a pagan culture. You want to you worship that God? Fine. You want to worship this God over here? Fine. You want to wa- worship a thousand gods? Fine. No problem. Just don't tell me what I should or shouldn't do. Don't tell me that what I'm doing is wrong. It sound familiar? A little bit of that happening in our culture today, right? It's very similar in this culture. You can believe whatever you want to believe. Whatever you believe is fine with me. And so what they were saying was true. That's the way the Romans believed. And when you came in saying what you're believing, all of you guys, is wrong because there's one true God. And the only way that you can be saved is through Jesus Christ. That was against what they believed. Now they took him before the magistrates. And in and, and Roman provinces, you always had two magistrates. And so that's what we have here, the two magistrates. And the crowd joined in attacking them. And the magistrates tore garments off of them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Now the two magistrates had what we call lictors. And the lictors were kind of their bodyguards. And they would, they would travel around with them and, and guard them. But if something, if punishment needed to be meted out, the lictors would do that. And so more than likely what's happening here, the blows that they received, that Paul and Silas received, were from the lictors. That's where we get the term, take your licks. You've heard that term before, right? This is where it comes from. The lictors would beat them. And so they would take their licks. Paul and Silas took their licks from the lictors. That's what's happening here. And so they took the blows upon them. They threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stock. So the inner prison is the, is the deepest part of the prison. More than likely, there were no windows. He says later when the earthquake happened, bring the lights, bring the lights. It was a place of of utter darkness. They take them into this place and they bind them. They're already bloody, right, from the beating. They they bind them in, in in these stocks. And at this time, the way that they would bind them, they were usually in a, such a situation that they couldn't really move their body very much. So after a time, your, your muscles would start to, start to cramp up because you couldn't stretch them out. You couldn't move them. So they were bloody. They were beaten. They were hurting from that. They were in a place that had no light whatsoever. Their muscles were cramping up. And what did they start to do? Verse 25 says that they started to sing and pray. And, and we, I think, oftentimes have a tendency to say, well, well, yeah, of course, this is Paul, right? This is Paul. Of course he's going to be singing and praying. It's Paul. But Paul's a man. And, and would we be one bit surprised? And would we, would we think any less of him if, if it read here that Paul was disheartened at what had just happened here? Paul was actually starting to doubt in some different ways. We read that about John the Baptist, right? John the Baptist had doubts. The the authors of the New Testament, they weren't concerned about writing the truth of what a person was going through. If a person was having doubts, they wrote the doubts in here. We don't read that about Paul. Instead, we read that he and Silas were singing and praying. We wouldn't be, uh, our culture, rather, may say something to the effect like Job's wife, after Job was going through everything that she had, that he had gone through and she had gone through. And she just finally said, why don't you just, just curse God and die? You can imagine something similar to that happening here. You say you love this God. You say you want to just live for him and tell people about him, but look at what he's done to you, Paul. Silas? Is this what a loving God does? Is this the way he treats those who follow him? But 
Paul and Silas would respond in a similar way that Job did. Though he slay me, I will praise him. Brothers and sisters, hard things happen in this life. We all go through hard things. We all, we all go through our trials. We go through our tribulations. We go through our testings. And it's when we go through those things do we have a tendency to, to just want to curse God and die, be done with it. Or do we have more of this attitude of Paul and Silas where even in the midst of our hurting, even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of times when it is hard to even pray, Hard to say one word in prayer because you are so down in whatever is happening around you. Is it in that moment that you pray, Lord, even though you slay me, I still praise you. That's the kind of attitude we have because I think Paul and Silas and Job have this right perspective of who God is. He doesn't owe us The fact that he sent his son to die for us. The fact that he has given us grace and mercy in the form of salvation through his son shows us how much he loves us. And if he needs to carry us through things like he took Paul and Silas and untold millions of other believers through, through the centuries for his purposes to be fulfilled, then we praise him. Because his purposes are far superior to ours. His, his way, his will, his, his, his plan for all things is much more important than how comfortable we are in the moment. Than how well things are going according to our plan in the moment. His plan needs to be preeminent. And when things aren't going our way, we still sing and we still pray. We still sing and we still praise him. We still worship Him because He is worthy. He is the only one worthy. Now, we're going to fast forward a little bit to 37 because it just blows me away. I mean, here He is. He's, he's just gone through all of this, right? But at the end, He says, when they, when they say, Hey, listen, you can leave now. I'm, okay, I'm just speaking for myself. If you say you can leave, all right. I'm out of here. See you. But Paul doesn't do that. He says, listen, no, 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 not so fast. I'm a Roman citizen. Now that means something. And there's a large, there's a story behind this as to why this means so much. I'm, I'm not going to go all into that right now. Maybe sometime in the future, but it's a fascinating story from Roman history as to why this means so much. But, but, but he says, no, I'm a Roman citizen. Well, that makes them stop dead in their tracks. Because what they have just done is serious. They have just condemned Paul and Silas, both Roman citizens. They have just beaten them. And what they have done is wrong. It is a serious, serious offense in Rome to treat Roman citizens like this. Now, my question is this. Paul, you have that ace up your sleeve. Why didn't you use that to begin with? Right? I mean, you're standing before the, the mattresses and say, listen, by the way, before we go any further here, my friend and I, we're Roman citizens. He doesn't do that. Now, we don't know all the, everything as Paul is thinking here and so forth. But ultimately, we know that things worked out the way that they were supposed to work out. And so here is Paul, and, and, and at, after he's gone through all of this, and, and the jailer has come to Christ, and again, we'll return to that in just, just a moment. They, they have come and they said, listen, we want to release you now. You're free to go. He says, no, no, you don't understand. I'm a Roman citizen. And I could just see the color going out of their cheeks. But I think that Paul didn't have, he didn't have a self-serving purpose in this. I, I don't think he was saying, hey, <laughs> watch this, Silas. Let's get him really scared here. Watch. I, I think he had a much grander purpose than that. I think he was concerned for the vindication and the validation of the gospel and not himself. Because what had happened here? Here's Paul and Silas, and they are going around and they are talking about Jesus. They are proclaiming the gospel. That they, are, they are setting people free from demon possession. But yet here they are, these two men, they have been arrested, they have been beaten, they have been thrown in jail. And so to everyone else's minds, they're looking at these men, they say, well, they must be really bad men. And what they have said must be false, must be a lie. I can just imagine Paul thinking that, listen, we have to vindicate 
the gospel, not ourselves. If we want the gospel to go forward here in Philippi and in this region, we need to make sure that these people understand we have not been condemned. What we did was not wrong. And I think that was his main purpose here. They had been shamed, they had been beaten, they had been prisoned. And they, I think Paul had seen, listen, the doors are going to be closed here to the gospel if we don't say something. And Paul desires for the doors to be opened wide again. He has the future in mind here, not just his particular circumstance in the moment. Because he could have got out of there very easily, been done with it, and moved on. He said, no, 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 it's worth another moment here to take care of this to make sure that the doors stayed open to the proclamation of the gospel. His actions keep the future in mind. There's a lesson here for us, right? How often do our actions just have the here and now in mind? I want to get out of this situation, so I do whatever needs to be done now. Kind of the immediate gratification type thing. What, what can we do to make this easier now? And Paul says, I'm not worried about the now. I'm worried about the future. I love this about him, and I think, I think it helps us to understand we need to have more of that type of understanding, that what we do in the here and now affects the future, right? We need to have this genera generational understanding of our actions in the here and now and how they impact the future. And so as we do things, as we plan ministries here, here as, we do, as we carry out ministry in our own personal lives, how does this impact not just the here and now, but the future as well? As we, in this political season, as we elect our next president or representative or senator or council person, how is this going to affect the future? We should probably take some time to think about this. Think about the types of things that they are going to enact, the types of laws that they're going to want to support, the types of laws that they're going to want to strike down, all of these different things. We need to have an eye to the future. And not just the here and now. Okay, let's back up now. 25 through 32, let's, what, what, what is happening now? They're, they're down there and they're singing and they're praising God and an earthquake comes. An earthquake comes, God touches their shackles and the shackles fall off. The doors come open. The jailer who is asleep is awakened. And what is he about to do? He's about to kill himself because he just knows... <laughs> What prisoner in their right mind, when their shackles are off and the doors are open, is going to stay there? But Paul cries out to him, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Jailer calls for the lights and rushed in, trembling with fear, and he fell down before Paul and Silas. And he asked this question that all of us have heard. And how glorious would it be if we could just be walking down the streets of Charlottesville and people just run up to us. How can I be saved? Walking through the mall, people just run up to us. How can I be saved? Oh, how awesome would that be? Well, that's the situation that Paul and Silas encounter here. The Roman jailer runs up to him and says, how can I be saved? And Paul doesn't go into this long theological treatise on, on what it means to be saved and, and who Jesus is and, and all of these different, th different things. He says very, very simply, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, is there a lot more to understand and and, and, and as far as who Jesus is and what he has done for us and all of that, yes, there is. But I think so often we kind of flip things and we say, you need to understand all of this before you come to Jesus. And Paul says, nope, nope, right here. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Now there was maybe more understanding, maybe, maybe because Paul and Silas have been there singing and praying and these types of things. Maybe there was a little bit more of a foundation. Maybe this guy understand, understood some more things. But I, I don't think we should go off of that assumption. I think we need to go off what Scripture says. And Scripture says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That's what it comes down to. That's what it always comes down to. There is such a richness to our salvation. There is such a richness to to who we are in Christ and the, the promises that we have in Jesus, who Jesus is, what he has accomplished for us, all of those types of things, they are glorious. 
But at the end of the day, how is a person saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus. It's that simple act of faith in believing in Him and then everything that we know about Christianity, everything we know about our inheritance in Him, promise and so forth, are ours. How kind and merciful our God is. Look at the three people that God has dealt with here just in, in, these, in this one chapter. We have Lydia, who comes from, again, probably a place of wealth. She, she sells purple fabrics, and, and, and we know that what kind of class usually bought the purple fabrics, and so she was probably well-respected. And then we have the, 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 the slave girl who was probably destitute, was probably not treated very well by her owners, just used and abused for what she could do for them. And now we have the Roman jailer who was probably a, a pagan. Uh, we don't know what kind of spiritual beliefs he had, but certainly he was pagan. It was probably a hodgepodge of beliefs and that type of thing. So, but we have God reaching into every single one of their lives and releasing them, setting them free, helping them to understand the gospel. Now, the slave girl, we know that the demon, she, the demon left her. She was set free. It doesn't say that she went on to become a follower of Jesus. But if I'm set free from a demon, I'm going to ask you a few more questions. But regardless, we see God setting her free from that kind of oppression that she had. So, so what we read in Acts 10.34 with Peter, when Peter says, he opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Three different people, three different socioeconomic class, classes, different backgrounds as far as what they believed and those types of things. God shows no partiality whatsoever. God sees a person who is lost and broken and suffering and needs salvation. But the question is, what prompted this question? From the jailer because we know again the jailer's a Roman he, he's pagan why would he ask this type of question what must I do to be saved because again that wasn't something that was in their vernacular that wasn't in their way of thinking they didn't really need in their mind they didn't really need to be saved from anything but the great thing is in some ways he's halfway there right when he asked this question what must I do to be saved Obviously, there's some kind of understanding. I need some kind of salvation. Well, the men to tell him what kind of salvation that is, is right here before them. And so he asked the question, half the battle's saved. Half the battle is won, I should say. I think really there's three things that contribute to this question. The first is, he must have had some kind of exposure right? He must have had some kind of exposure to the basics of Christianity. The slave girl's proclamation, the way of salvation, the accusations that, that had been hurled at them by the, by the owners of the slave girl and then the magistrates throwing them in jail and those types of things. I mean, this guard wasn't oblivious to what was happening in his city. I'm sure there were things going around and he was hearing different things. And then the, the, these men are, are right here before him. And they are singing and they are praying. And what was the content of their prayers? This is Paul, by the way. I'm sure he wasn't praying for Aunt Edna. Can you imagine the depth of these prayers? And by the way, it's okay to pray for Aunt Edna. You know what I'm saying there. These were, a really, these were, these were meaty prayers that he was praying. And so who knows, maybe during the course of this, as he is praying, he is praising God, thanking God that he was saved from the life that he lived. He was saved into this knowledge of who Jesus is, all of these different things. So, so maybe some knowledge, maybe some of these, these little tidbits that this man was hearing was starting to come, and he was starting to understand some things, understand that, well, wait a minute, these men are talking about being sinners and needing salvation and Jesus and all of a sudden this earthquake, and so he blurts out, what must I do to be saved? So that's number one. He had to have some kind of exposure, some, even if it was just a very, very minute amount, some kind of exposure to the basics of Christianity. But then two, he had just encountered two men he could respect, right? 
Even if you don't agree with what they're saying, you have to respect these men for en enduring what they're enduring and enduring it for the reason that they're enduring it, because they are standing up for their beliefs, but then to do it in such a way that they are doing it. Singing and praying and praising God. I may not agree with what you believe, but I have a lot of respect for you. I think that may be something that's happening here. You would have to respect their, their sincerity of faith, their attitude under intense hardships, staying when they could have fled, thinking of him over themselves in that particular situation. That's going to speak volumes, right? Maybe these were the only Christians he had ever the likelihood of that statement being true is pretty high. Again, think of Philippi, thinking that this is the, the gospel is just coming in. They are the point of the spear. Saul, uh, Paul and Silas making their way in. The point of the spear of the gospel has just come to this town. These are probably the first Christians he's ever met. Now, here's a question for you. Because this is a question that I had to ask myself. What would a person's impression be of Christianity if you were the only Christian they knew? Is your life more likely to lead people to ask that question? A friend of yours, maybe in a moment of crisis, going through hard times, have they looked at you and have they seen something in your life that they would say in a moment of crisis, Todd, what do I do here? Todd, I am at my wit's end. Todd, I am without hope. I, I need some answers. Can you help me here? If you were the only Christian in a person's life, what would their view of Christianity be? And in those moments of real crisis, would they come to you for answers? And then that is the third one, a moment of crisis. So we, 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 we think that maybe there was some kind of exposure to the basics of Christianity. They had, he had just encountered two men he could respect, Paul and Silas, but then this moment of crisis comes, right? This earthquake comes. This thing that had just shaken him to his core. And he asked the question, what must I do to be saved? Those types of things happen, right? The major crisis in life, it, it, it makes us ask these types of questions. Why am I here? What's important? What's true? What's my purpose in life? Is there a purpose in life? And so we have this moment of crisis in this man's life, and he asks the question, the most important question that ever could be uttered by a human being, what must I do to be saved? And of course, he receives the only answer that gives a satisfactory answer. One that is so simple, yet absolutely complete in everything that it offers. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The jailer believes this and his life is absolutely transformed. He takes them home and he cares for them and he, he binds up their wounds and he, he gives them food. This is a man whose, whose profession meant something. He was following it up with his actions. I think he understood very quickly the magnitude of what just happened in his life, of what he had been forgiven of. This profession of faith that he had just made, he didn't take it lightly. He understood what it meant. And A.W. Tozer says this, if your profession means nothing to you, then it is a pretty safe bet that it means nothing to God. Let that sink in a little bit. Because a lot of us profess Christ, but when you start looking at the fruit of a person's life and you don't see fruit of a, of a follower of Jesus, it's just a profession. And obviously that profession doesn't mean very much because you don't see it outworking in their life. It's a pretty good indicator that they may not be born again. And that's something, that's, that's, that's certainly not something that we can judge 
it's, it's something that can cause concern in our lives. When we have someone in our lives that we love and they say that they are followers of Jesus, yet we are not seeing fruit in their lives, that means that this, just, this profession doesn't mean a lot to them. But then the question is, we have to turn that around on us, is how much does my profession mean to me? Am I living it out? Is this something I really believe? Those around me, would they see that this is something that is significant to me and that means something to me? Because I am, I am willing to reorder the things in my life, to, to reorder them around Jesus and what he desires for me, the way that he wants me to live, the way that he wants me to think, the way that he wants me to treat people. That question just haunts me. If someone were to meet me and I'm the only Christian they have ever met in their life, what, what would they think about Christianity? So those are the questions that I'm going to leave you with this morning. Are those around you exposed to the effects of the gospel in your life and its, its outworkings? What would someone think of Christianity if you were the only Christian they knew? And would you be able to answer that question for a person in the midst of a crisis? If someone came up to you broken and confused, what do I do to be saved? I am without hope. Can you help me? Would you be able to help them? Would you be able to give them hope? Would you be able to help them understand this? This is the answer that you've been looking for. Now, I'm not asking you to double down today in your own efforts. Oh, yeah, you're right, Pastor. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm failing in this area. I really need to do better in this. I really need to do better in this area. Brothers and sisters, if we start putting that kind of yoke upon ourselves, thinking that it's up to us to do better, we're setting ourselves up for a failure. Now, what do I mean by that? Are we supposed to give effort? Yes, we are. Are we supposed to live our lives? Are we supposed to put effort into the things that we do to serve our Lord and our Savior? Yes, we are. But when we start to do those things without first backing up and just looking and beholding, looking at Jesus and beholding His goodness and beholding what He has done for us and just resting in that and praising Him that everything that ever needed to be done has been done. And I just need to appropriate that in my life, that truth in my life, and rest in that and live in that. And then ask Him, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me to be transformed in such a way that these types of things just become a natural outworking of my life. That when people are around me, they notice there is something different. Not because I'm just really, really trying hard, but because I have such a relationship with you that it's just natural. That's what Christ calls us to. He doesn't call us just to work harder. He's not calling us to work extra hard today. He's calling us to rest in Him even more today. So that as we rest in Him, the works just become natural. And they're not burdensome. And we live this life before Him this life of grace, this life of love, this life that has been transformed in seemingly effortless ways because of the transforming work that He has done in our hearts. And as He does this work, it helps us not to point to ourselves and make people think how good I am or anything like that. It helps us to do what? To point to Him, the only source of hope that anyone in the world ever has. Jesus Christ.